So today we have a webinar about uh, FIP guidelines for dissolution testing of sol sol solid oral dosage uh, forms. And our speaker is uh, Dieter Friedel. And uh, Dieter, I just want like to introduce him. So he got a university graduation in pharmacy and chemistry and a PhD in pharmaceutical chemistry. He started working at Bayer Leverkusen in 1987, more than 15 years professional experience in quality control development for drug products, additional six years as head of this department. He had extensive international experience in product development, analytical method development, dissolution testing, validation, method transfer, scale-up, stability studies, laboratory automation, computer validation, regulatory submissions, responsible as qualified person for the release of clinical samples. So you see tons of experience in many years of professional experience. And over 18 years, he has professional experience in global quality assurance with responsibilities for the global quality system of Bayer Healthcare, monitoring, evaluating, and commenting external regulations are his task also. And since 2005, he is the chair of the FIP focus group dissolution drug release. And since 2019, he is the chair of the FIP special interest group regulatory science and quality. So that's the reason why he is the correct person to give this starting overview presentation. So just a short remark on my person. So I'm the designated moderator today. Uh, my name is Jungs Limberg and I'm a scientific director in the, and heading the unit scientific quality in European procedures in the Department of International Affairs at BFAM, that's the German regulatory agency. And as such, I'm a member in the Quality Working Party of the European Medicines Agencies. And recently, I've acted as rapporteur for the reflection paper on setting specification of dissolution for all solid dosage forms. And uh, my main areas in the regulatory um, dossiers are dissolution testing by availability, analytical development, and statistics. So. That's the reason why I was asked to be moderator here. So, uh, technical issue. So, if you want to ask some questions, please uh, write down a chat. I will have a look at the chat and follow it. And then, uh, when the presentation has finalized and uh, Dieter finished his presentation, then I will quote uh, the questions from the chat received from you. It's a pity that you cannot talk directly, but having uh, so many people here, we are close to 100 now, then we have lots of background noise if all the mix will be open. So the FIP has decided to close all the mix, but uh, at least you can chat and I will have the check. Uh, yeah, I will track the check during the presentation. So maybe just for exercise, Wienert, can you give send me a chat because then I can see whether it will work. If it's possible or someone else, I don't care. Just want to see one chat. Okay, I've not seen any chat. Is it possible for you to chat? Dieter, you have an idea because I do not get any chat here. Um, I just sent a chat to everyone now. I send, I can see your chat. Yeah, but I'm not looking for questions from your side. Can you see my chat? I see your chat as well. So, and I see both chats are to all of the persons, but yeah, nothing happens here. 
Well, um, then maybe uh, we have to ask afterwards uh, uh, via microphone. Okay. Okay, so then we do it this way. I'm sorry about that, but uh, sometimes these are technical problems. Okay, so then maybe you try to send a chat, but now I think we should start. So, Dieter, please could you start your presentation? Thank you. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to this. A webinar of FIP. Uh, first is, can you see my screen? Hello, can you? Uh, yeah, yep. I can, can see you? your screen. I can see it, but uh, yeah, Maybe I think the, the other. Okay. And so uh, I see it perfectly and I see no raised hands, so I guess everybody can see the screen. Okay, well, very fine. Um, yeah, well, I see a great end. So now I see at least uh, Miss Annan, Mr. Annan uh, saw the screen. Okay. Um, great. I'm very pleased that so many people join uh, this meeting we had when I went to the presentation now and started uh, about 100 participants. That's very amazing. And uh, it's a very pleasure for me that to join this meeting. Before I go into the detail, I would like to give a short overview about the activities uh, of uh, the Special Interest Group Regulatory Science and Quality, and especially uh, on the so called faculty group dissolution in vitro drug release. This group provides a global and independent platform for scientific discussion among academia, industry, and regulators on dissolution and drug release testing. The group reviews and comments on draft guidelines which impact dissolution testing. We most recently commented on the WHO guideline dissolution test for solid oral dosage form. And we also publish papers and guidelines. One is the FIP guidelines for dissolution testing for solid oral dosage forms, which I will now present. We published also reports on dissolution in vitro release testing of novel special dosage forms we published a position paper on qualification of pedal and basket dissolution apparatus and several other papers. And on the last one, we had already a webinar in December. The group also organized workshops in times before Corona. We had one on bioreligant dissolution testing in the United States and Europe. We had one on minor medicines. And what's very important and unique is that we uh, organize hands on dissolution workshops in countries to improve the drug product quality. This is also uh, workshops with the equipment where one can learn to calibrate and handle the apparatus correctly. And most recently, the focus group participated in the drafting of the ICH guideline on BCS-based bioweavers, ICHM9, by providing comments on the draft guidance. The ICHM9 guideline and the Q&A paper reached step four in November 2019. And to show where the members of this group come from, uh, we look that uh, we have, they come from regulatory bodies, from industry, academica, and pharmacopoeia, 
and they should be spread worldwide. So we have members from Europe, we have members from the United States, Greece, Romania, and Japan. And this uh, gives us a, a global overview and a good exchange uh, between the different disciplines and the different regions. And now I come to our FIP guidelines for dissolution testing of solid oral dosage forms. Uh, you can find this, and this was published in the Journal of Pharmaceutical Sciences in 2018. And the presentation will cover not all aspects which are described in this guideline. It will cover the concept of dissolution testing, the dissolution aberrators, method development aspects, validation of the analytical method, validation of the sampling, a sample handling, and justification of specification. Well, what's the important concept of dissolution testing? Imito dissolution testing serves as an important tool for characterizing the biopharmaceutical quality of a product at different stages in its life cycle. It starts in early development and the in vitro properties are supportive for choosing between alternative formulation candidates for further development and for evaluation of active ingredients, drug substances. In vitro dissolution data are supportive in the elevation and interpretation of possible risks. For example, dose dumping when you consider extended release dosage forms, also uh, food effects on bioavailability and interaction with other drugs, which might influence gastrointestinal environmental conditions. In vitro dissolution testing has a high relevance in quality control in the case of batch release for market after production and also uh, for stability testing. In vitro dissolution data are of great importance when assessing changes in production site, manufacturing processes or formulation and assist in decisions concerning the need for conducting supporting bioavailability studies. Since in vitro dissolution is a physical test defined by convention and it is of destructive nature, proving reliability requires special attention, defined suitable testing equipment and experimental design, adequate physical analytical validation. And we, I will come more into detail in the following sessions. These are the uh, compendial dissolution apparatus for uh, oral dosage forms. Um, that is the apparatus one, the ba basket apparatus, apparatus two, pedal apparatus. We have the reciprocating cylinder and flow through cell. And I will not go into detail how to qualify these apparatus. This is very important because we had this in uh, our uh, webinar in December. And now the first step when one comes to uh, the solution method is uh, which dissolution apparatus is most suitable for my formulation. The choice of a suitable dissolution apparatus and conditions should start with the elevation of the compendial apparatus described in the Pharmacopoeia Europea, the Japanese Pharmacopoeia, and the USP. 
If these apparatus and conditions are not discriminative enough or show a high variability, the next step is to elevate modifications of the compendial apparatus. The last recourse is to use non compendial apparatus and condition with an appropriate justification and demonstration of the discriminatory power of the test. But this is the last thing you can, should do. Normally, uh, the compendial methods uh, are suitable and uh, reliable, so that one should take uh, the compendial dissolution apparatus. And the two most commonly used dissolution apparatus are the basket and pedal apparatus. They are simple, robust, adequately standardized apparatus. They are the first choice for the in vitro dissolution testing of immediate as well as controlled modified release preparations. Now I come to the method development. After we have chosen the apparatus, uh, we have to um, consider the other parameters uh, which are important for a dissolution test method. And the main goal of a method uh, is when we speak about quality control purposes, uh, that these um, methods should meet the following criteria. It must be robust and over long time periods. Yeah? When you develop a method today, it should give the same results uh, also in three or four or five years. So uh, one has to consider that this is has to be reliable over a long time period. It must be easily transferred from lab to lab. It must be able to discriminate between batches with respect to critical process parameters and critical material attributes, which may have an impact on the in vivo biopharmaceutical behavior. However, the method should not be over discriminating, such that minor differences in the manufacturing process or incoming material, which do not have a clinical relevant impact on the in vivo behavior, result in product failure. And I will come more into detail into that when we talk about discriminatory power. After we have selected the apparatus, the next is the dissolution medium. And to come to a suitable dissolution medium, one has to evaluate the solubility of the active pharmaceutical ingredient at 37 degrees centigrade in aqueous buffer solutions at different pH values. And typical buffers uh, are at pH 1.2, 4.5, 6 6.8. Select an appropriate dissolution medium providing sync conditions for the API. And what is sync conditions? There are several definitions, and we have chosen in the FIP guidelines the following definition. Sync conditions are defined as a volume of medium that is at least three times that is required in order to form a saturated solution of drug substance. Sync conditions assure that the solution is not significantly limited by solubility characteristics. In general, an aqueous medium should be used for dissolution test. In former times, other organic solvents were used, but this is not recommended. Uh, one should use aqueous media. And the pH is in the range of 1 to 7.5. That's a physiological pH range, and it's typically pH 1.2, 4.5, 6.8.
The use of pure water without any buffers is discouraged as the pH and surface tensions can vary depending on the source of water. And what also happens is that the pH changes during the dissolution test itself due to the influence of the drug product. In some cases, one cannot reach sink conditions. This is for poorly soluble drugs from the BCS class two and four. And if sink conditions cannot be achieved at any pH in the physiological pH range, surfactants may be added to enhance the solubility. And here, it's recommended to take chemically well-defined surfactants, for example, sodium dodecyl sulfate, uh, because this is a, a, can be um, obtained in analytical grade and is well-defined. But other surfactants are also often used, but they are mixtures. For example, polysorbates between 20 and 80, polyoxyethylene 23, low ether bridge, or cetyl trimethyl ammonium bromide CTAB. I personally have the most ex positive experience with uh, sodium dodecyl sulfate. The concentration of the surfactant should be the minimum amount needed to obtain sink conditions and be justified by solubility data at 37 degree in order to maintain the discriminatory power of the dill solution test method. In some cases, different dosage strengths of a drug product um, are in the market and have to be tested. And in these cases, it is uh, important to take the same dissolution method and dissolution medium for all uh, dosage strength. Thus, the amount of surfactant added to the dissolution medium could provide sink conditions for the highest dose. Another quite specific thing is in case of um, gelatin formulations, the addition of enzymes. And there are different opinions to add this. In the USP, um, it is described that one can add enzymes. Uh, gelatin can uh, tend for, to cross-linking. And this cross-linking can alter the in vitro dissolution behavior of the gelatin capsules or gelatin-coated tablets. It could be shown, and there are several publications uh, on that, that this effect of pellicle uh, form, formation uh, does not reflect a possible failure in vivo. And therefore, in uh, USP, um, enzymes can be added. Pepsin can be added for dissolution media with pH equal or below 4.0. Papain or bromelain for dissolution medium with pH above 4 and below 6.8 and pancreatine for dissolution medium with pH equal to or above 6.8. And one has to consider that this is not accepted uh, in all regions. In Japan, the Japanese pharmacopoeia does not mention the use of enzymes, and the Japanese regulatory agency does not accept the use of enzymes for dissolution tests in the specification test, and also not in the assessment 
of dissolution similarity. In Europe, the European pharmacopoeia also does not mention the use of enzymes. However, the use of enzymes can be acceptable on a case-by-case -case basis if justified. Another important parameter in the method development is the heterodynamic the dynamics effect. Um, when we talk about the pedal and basket apparatus, the most uh, common volumes which I use is 500 to 1 liter. And historically, many methods are described in 900 milliliter. That is a historical thing and uh, it is quite often used uh, 900 milliliter. For immediate release dosage forms, uh, the apparatus one, uh, a typical steering weight is 50 to 100 RPM. For apparatus two, the pedal 50 or 75 RPM. One has to start with the 50 RPM. This is the most uh, reliable um, rotation speed for the pedal apparatus. But in some cases, a formulation uh, can form cones, the coning under the pedal. And in these cases, an increase of the steering speed from 50 to 75 RPM is typically sufficient to reduce coning and leads to less variability uh, in the results. But this has to be uh, justified in your uh, application. Another aspect regarding the medium is a deaeration. Uh, air bubbles adhering to the dosage unit may alter the dissolution rate, especially for fully soluble drugs. And the significance of deaeration should be investigated by comparing dissolution data in deaerated and non deaerated medium. For dissolution media containing surfactants, Degassing is usually not an option because of excessive foaming. And the effect of dissolved air on the dissolution behavior is minimized by the lower surface tension. From my uh, experience in dissolution testing, we uh, have never the need uh, for media containing surfactants to uh, have any deterioration and uh, any effect of air bubbles which adhere to the dosage unit. For the pedal apparatus, uh, one can use sinkers and the use of sinkers have to be justified. Um, and the reason to use sinkers is that uh, the dosage form can uh, float for example, capsules, or stick to the vessel wall. And sinkers can significantly influence the dissolution behavior of a dosage form. And the type of sinker has to be carefully evaluated and described in the dissolution procedure. This is a harmonized approach between Pharmacopoeia Europea, Japanese Pharmacopoeia, and USP. Uh, and they recommend the use of a wire helix and a small wire basket. Um, but all three pharmacopoeias also allow the use of other sinkers, uh, which have to be described. And here in the picture, you see uh, a wire basket, which was originally described in the Japanese pharmacopoeia.
Now I come to the very important point of the discriminatory power. Well, the dissolution test should be able to discriminate between drug product batches or different quality and or different in vivo performance. However, a dissolution method should not be over discriminating. The intention of a robust QC dissolution method is to ensure consistent in vivo performance of the product. And how to show that uh, the dissolution um, method can discriminate between uh, different batches. And one can check this, for example, uh, when you modify the active pharmaceutical ingredient properties, such as particle size and crystal forms, or uh, modify the excipient quantity, quality, and grade. One can mo uh, make modifications on the manufacturing process parameters, for example, blending time and rate granulation conditions, compression force and dwell time, coating conditions, for example, temperature, moisture, spray rate. One can stress samples. These are means to, to modify on purpose uh, the properties of the uh, drug uh, product. And when the the solution method should show uh, those differences. But one should be careful, uh, not all modifications have an impact on the in vivo behavior. So one should avoid uh, to be over discriminating. And here's an example for Primidone, 50 milligram, and one uh, sees uh, that in uh, under the conditions in water and uh, pedal, 50 RPM, one has big differences between the new and the old uh, formulation of Musoli. But when you see the in vivo uh, curves of these two types of formulation, there is no difference. And this shows that the dissolution method with 50 RPM in water is over discriminating. When I come to the validation, and for the dissolution method, we have to consider two aspects for the validation. One is the quantitative part, the analytics, and one is the dissolution part, where one considers the sampling, uh, sample handling. The quantitation part, the validation of the quantitation part is done according to the ICH guidance analytical validation, that's ICH Q2. And uh, ICH Q2 uh, mainly covers uh, chromatographic methods. Currently, uh, ICH Q2 is under revision. Um, also to include other analytical methods, for example, near-infrared spectroscopy, and it will be published together with ICHQ14. ICHQ14 is the method development of analytical methods, and ICHQ2 and Q14 will come uh, together because there's an interaction between these both uh, guidelines. The aspects which are validated are uh, the five uh, topics, the specificity, the linearity and range, 
the accuracy, the precision, and the robustness. And how to do this in a dissolution? Specificity? Well, the main thing is that the test results must not be affected by the excipients and also the coating the printing ink and capsule shell. Also other drug substances that may be present in the product must not affect the data. And that has also been um, checked during the method development um, if the um, active substance is uh, stable in the uh, medium and possible decadence should not affect the test results. The specificity evaluation can be done by spiking a placebo version of the finished product with known amounts of the drug substance. And you can use those um, solutions uh, also uh, for other uh, test items of the validation. Yeah, this you can use, for example, this also for the accuracy. The linearity and range. The linearity should be evaluated using at least five concentrations, encompassing the entire dissolution profile. Linear, and there uh, also one has to consider one when one has different dosage strength and one uses the same uh, method. The range should cover the lowest uh, dosage form and the highest. For example, when you have a 10 milligram and a 100 milligram uh, formulation, the linear ET range uh, should cover the whole range from below 20 milligram uh, and above 100 milligram. And the linearity is typically calculated by using an appropriate at least square regression program. The square of the correlation coefficient is not less than 0.98. And the y intercept must be importantly different from zero. And the accuracy. Accuracy is typically evaluated by preparing multiple samples containing the active ingredient and any other component present in the dosage form, excipients, coating, capsule, in concentration with a linearity range of the method. And the measured recovery is typically 95 to 105% of the amount added. Precision that um, comprises the repeatability, intermediate precision, and reproducibility. Uh, the precision should be evaluated to include spiking of drug substances into placebo matrix or evaluation of actual formulations to cover the anticipated concentration range. Repeatability, you do the same thing several times. Intermediate precision is you do the same thing at several times, but taking for ex modification uh, of the instrumentation of the operator, some of those uh, modifications and repeatability and intermediate precision is expected in the validation program and reproducibility may be considered. Reproducibility is the interlap uh, variation yeah? when you go from, lab, from one lab to another lab. Robustness. 
And this is the robustness of the quantitation part. Uh, the robustness of a method is a measure of its capacity to remain unaffected by small but deliberate variations of defined parameters and provides an indication of its reliability during normal usage. Yeah, one do this, for example, when you take HPLC quantification, one has small variations in the pH of the element or the composition of the mobile phase, the flow rate could be a little bit modified. Important is the detection wavelength, uh, the current temperature, as well as a type of stationary phase should be studied. And in case of UV quantitation, small deliberate variations, for example, in the detection wavelengths, baseline correction, pH, and ionic strengths of the dissolution medium, as well as the amount of organic solvent in the reference solutions should be investigated. And also the robustness is a dissolution part would be validated. Um, for example, uh, one can uh, have small variation in the pH of the medium or a small variation in the surfactant concentration of the dissolution medium. One can have small modifications in the temperature steering speed, the deaeration, sample technique, where, for example, with kind of filters you use or uh, filtering device, and the tablet placement should be also uh, examined. And I go further on with the dissolution part validation. Uh, an important factor is, of course, the filtration. And the filtration removes undissolved material, including the API. And that may otherwise interfere with the analytical result. Selection of the proper filter material is important and should be experimentally justified. Important characteristics to consider when choosing a filter material are the type, size, and pore size. Use of the correct filter dimensions will improve throughput and recovery and reduce clogging. The proposed filter types should be validated for use to demonstrate appropriate recovery. This is important. One has to ensure that the track is not absorbed at the filters or adsorbed to the filters. There are methods, and I add this, um, where one do not filter. For example, when one uses fiber optics, and of course one has to validate also, especially uh, when one uh, goes to um, online analytics like uh, fiber optics, that uh, there is no interference of uh, the non-dissolved material in the medium. That's quite. Um, tricky, and I go not into detail to that. Another part which has to be validated is in, uh, when one automates uh, the dissolution test. And in these cases, a comparison should be performed between the automated and the manual procedures. And one can do this in two ways. Uh, one way is the so-called parallel approach. 
in this case the manual sampling is performed out of the same vessel of the automated equipment you run this in parallel uh, you run the automatic system and sample manually and one can do this in the independent sampling approach in two dissolution runs one is automated and one is manual and using the same homogeneous sample and uh, the comparison of independent dissolution experiments is preferred because the influence of the entire automated equipment not only the sampling procedure itself on the dissolution results is investigated for example dipping in uh, the automated uh, sampling device can have a diff can uh, have a cause a different hydrodynamic in the uh, dissolution uh, equipment and influence the test results. So the independent experiment is preferred. Results from these experiments should not differ by more than 5% depending on the accuracy and precision of the method at least for the specified time points, but preferably for all sampling time points. That was the automation part. And uh, when I recapture, then we have the validation. Uh, in the validation, we have the validation of the analytical part and the dissolution part and we uh, covered the aspect of automation and now i come to the specification and uh, for the specification for all solid dosage forms i uh, start with the immediate release formulations normally for immediate release formulation a uh, single or two-point acceptance criterion is acceptable to control product quality and how to specify uh, this is the minimum amount dissolved at this specified time for example when you say q is equal to 75 percent after 30 minutes uh, Q is the mean value of 12 units and Q is the reference figure quoted in the harmonized companion test. If only six units are tested, the lowest single value must be not less than 80%. That means Q plus, plus 5%. This is the specification for immediate release formulations and more complicated is the case for extended release formulations and for extended release formulations typically a three point acceptance uh, criteria will be included in the spec and one has to take an early time point this uh, is that the drug is not rapidly released from the formulation and that one does not have uh, the so-called dose dumping. And the first time point uh, is typically uh, not more than 20% plus minus 10% released, for example, after one hour. Then one has to define a mid-range time point. This is when the drug is released uh, to 50, uh, between 50 and 70 percent of the nominal dose, for example, after six hours. And the range is typically plus minus 10 percent, but can be just uh, extended if justified by clinical data. And then at least 
a final time point is specified showing that drug release from the formulation essentially complete and this uh, spec would mean not less than 80 percent of the drug is released from the formulation after eight hours for example conclusion uh, dissolution testing is the most powerful in vitro test for solid oral dosage forms to assure product quality and product performance, including drug bioavailability. With the developments in formulation technology and advancing knowledge in dissolution science, there's an increasing challenge in determining appropriate dissolution test methods to cover API characteristics, formulation development, quality control, and change control. That's covering in the life cycle management. Advances in instrumentation have resulted in development of more robust dissolution apparatus. To support the global marketing and availability of drugs, it is essential that regulatory authorities and pharmacopoeias work together to standardize and harmonize the dissolution requirements for global applications. I would not like to close my presentation before I give you um, an outlook on the next events of our focus group. Um, I did not cover today uh, the biopharmaceutical aspect, and we will have uh, two sessions uh, in this year, planned in this year. One will be on bioavalent dissolution testing for solid oral dosage forms, and also a session on in vitro, in vivo comparison. And with that, I thank you for uh, your attention. Hope to see you uh, at the next uh, FIP congresses. Otherwise, uh, also, uh, I'm happy uh, when you participate in one of the next uh, webinars. Thank you so far. Now we can open uh, the uh, question and answer session. So Dieter, thank you very much for the presentation. Can you hear me? I can. Okay, so perfect. Now we open the question and answer session. The problem was it is uh, yeah, the FIP, uh, presented kind of other version of this program, which I was used of. So it was not the chat, but you are able to raise some questions and I found it and we received lots of questions and I noted them. Uh, it's except the last two ones because now I'm talking, but they are noted as well. So now I got something in Arabic. So Jerry, I think the best would be to follow the questions in the chronological order to the presentation. We have received two or three questions in just in the beginning before the presentation, but these are more general questions, so I put them to the end. And I'm not uh, sure whether I pronounce all your names correctly, so I just use the first word as a surname when I call you. Okay, and we received some uh, um, some questions regarding FIP, so organization. I'm sorry, but there's no one from FIP here. So there was a question what's about the annual fee and where to get a certificate of participation. I have no idea. And, and we had one question, uh, Dieter, whether this uh, slides will be available. Do you know whether they are available on the FIP site or yes. do you have any idea? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
they will be on the uh, FIP uh, uh, website. Okay. And also, uh, the record um, of this session is available on the FIP. Okay, uh, so right. the first question was about sodium lauryl sulfate. There is some uh, um, confusion about the terminology. Maybe, Dieter, you just can confirm that SDS, sodium lauryl sulfate, and I think there's some other names, sodium dodecyl sulfate, so that's all the same. That's the same, yeah. yeah. Sodium dodecyl sulfate, sodium lauryl sulfate, that's the same. <laughs> And SDS is an, another synonym for that. Yeah, that's the abbreviation okay. for sodium dodecylsulfate. So thank you very much, that uh, for the the colleague who asked for that because this is clarified it's to everybody. Quite interesting. There are different grades of uh, SDS, and uh, my experience is that one should take the highest grade to have uh, very um, reliable results. Okay, so thank you. Then next question was um, about slide 15. In Europe, it's indicated that the use of enzymes may be acceptable with justification. In such case, enzymes should be used by default in the medium or only if the testing is falling due to obvious cross-linking. Um. I have not, uh, well, the, I'm not sure if I have understood the question correctly. Okay, I just so, repeat it again. It's uh, about the use of enzymes in Europe, whether you use it by default uh, or only if the test is failing due to cross-linking. Oh, yeah. When uh, one has to justify, yeah? the, the cross-linking um, occurs uh, when uh, the uh, capsule um, during this storage, when it is uh, not fresh, when it is older. And um, of course, one has to show that really cross-linking um, happens. Yeah? One has to justify uh, the addition of enzymes. And one can see this uh, in the pellicle uh, formation quite well under the pedal. When, when there's a typical um, uh, uh, capsule uh, pellicle forming. Okay. So thank you very much. So we go to the next question. Wait, this window is very small. Okay. Mm -hmm. So how do we know if a dissolution method is over discriminating during the early development phase, especially no in vivo data is available? Now this over discriminating can only uh, compare to um, in vivo data. Uh, but what's good is in the early uh, development when you have um, uh, differences in the dissolution behavior, you see that your dissolution method can distinguish between uh, different characteristics of the drug product. So that is much better than when you don't see anything. Okay, so shortly spoken, if you do not have any in vivo data, you have no chance, but uh, you get some hints anyway. Okay. So then we have the next question. So in, oh wait, it's a long question. Okay, so in generic drug confirming in vitro process in India, as it is made of similarities in active pharmaceutical ingredient, but different excipients, which able to give release behavior 90, 95 to 99%, without to do in vivo process. I not get this that point. It is good in quality or not as it is available cheap compared to branded products. So maybe this person Ankur Bai Patel, maybe you can unmute yourself and maybe explain the question because I'm 
not sure what you really mean. I tried to open your mic, mic uh, Yeah, maybe the question is uh, for okay. uh, generic drug applications, in which cases uh, one can have a bio waiver uh, and only with the uh, dissolution data. And uh, for this, um, we have the bio waiver guideline, the ICHM9, uh, where for BCS. Uh, one and three drugs, viable waivers can be uh, achieved under certain um, preconditions. Okay. And then, uh, I cannot refer the complete ICHM9, but uh, in, it is applicable for uh, soluble APIs. It is applicable for immediate release uh, drug products, and immediate release uh, means uh, testing conditions 50 RPM and uh, release uh, in 15 uh, minutes 80%. I'm not sure if I um, have uh, covered the question, but I think this could be in that direction. So, Uncle Bai, maybe you can speak. Hi. Yeah, hi. We can hear you. Yes. Yeah, I can. Uh, you can hear me. Uh, yeah. I just got the question, sir. Yeah, it means uh, in India, uh, generic drug. Generic drug uh, just uh, considered by just in vitro test. Okay, so there is no need to uh, consider for the I means for in vivo. Yeah, just for in vitro test, uh, we just come from the generic drug. So is it uh, uh, good in quality if we if we compare to generic and branded because branded which is made by the in vitro and in vivo test, but generic just made by the only in vitro test. So sir, uh, quality wise, sir. Uh, uh means what is your uh means uh consideration for the uh like a generic drug so okay we, maybe i answer that uh, again because it's uh dita said it in in europe and us we have a system called biowaver meaning getting a marketing authorization for generic without having in vivo data and this is acceptable only in uh in cases where the drug substance and the drug product are both not critical to dissolution. So meaning highly soluble drug substances in simple standard formulations with immediate release. And in these cases, if the, uh, the dissolution is, uh, is spontaneous at different conditions for both products test and reference, then the marketing authorization can be authorized without in vivo data okay so i hope that explains it now we go to the next question so this is again about this uh, how to look see for over discrimination without having in vivo data we have answered that already yeah now it's a good one uh, how can we prove robustness from sampling technique and tablet position could you give any brief explanation about that technique? It's from Dea Alicia. Yeah, that's a really tricky question, a quite practical one. For example, um, uh, when you have a um, uh, drug which is sensitive uh, to the agitation and the hydrodynamics, and you place it directly under the pedal. Uh, and then you place it uh, not under the pedal, but a little beside uh, uh, at the um, vessel wall. If, and then test if this has an influence. Um, this could be the uh, positioning uh, of the tablet, for example, or when you have the sampling 
um, where you put um, this is described in the pharmacopoe where you put uh, the sampling device exactly um, in the uh, uh, vessel but you can change a little bit to see if this has an influence because in, uh, if the sampling position is uh, sensitive uh, in the method yeah these are topics one can check uh, in the case of testing the robustness okay so it's a question from the same person from De Alicia again it's close to that if our drug is absorbed to the filter does it mean we use centrifugation the problem of centrifugation is high variability because of position dependent concentration simple take another filter okay <laughs> yeah, the, you can uh, take glass filters, for example, which uh, do not uh, tend to absorb in, in that uh, way. But it, it depends, of course, uh, on the uh, formulation. Or okay, so do you recommend to use other filters than centrifugation? Yeah, I would not okay. recommend to uh, take centrifugation. Okay, perfect. Next question. Do you have any recommendation for validation of three media dissolution profile, especially in low soluble medium? I have not got uh, the question. Mean... Same with me. I do not understand the question. Maybe, Dr. Valak, you can reformulate it and send it again because I go through the, the other questions and then. We can add that at the end. Okay. So the next one, your specification for modified release formulation seems very limited to only some products and very different from the USP database for the modified release formulations. Any particular reason for this? This comes from Wu Lin. And this was only an example. Now, uh, the the time points uh, after one hour or six and eight hours, it's only uh, an example. Important is that one has three um, time points. One at the quite beginning when about twenty percent um, is dissolved. One in the middle when fifty to seventy percent is uh, dissolved, and one to show that there is a complete dissolution that is uh, when about 80 percent um, is dissolved the times um, uh, are only uh, examples but so, this is okay. uh, also in the um, usp database that uh, extended release uh, mm. drugs have the uh, three time points and especially it's important that one has the range uh, the specified uh, level for example 50 percent plus minus minus 10 percent that means from 40 to 60 percent and the plus minus 10 uh, percent um, is um, important in, uh, in the drug application and when that when one has a higher range for example 40 to 65 or then one has to justify these with clinical data okay so next question i think i think it's kind of incomplete it's from leonard it reads what's the essence of ph testing of dissolute dissolu testing of the media before and after dissolute point 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 so maybe we you reformulate then we can go to the question now from adeline hi i would like uh, to maybe, ask maybe it's this point uh, when when one starts the dissolution one checks the ph and also uh, one check can check the ph during the solution and after the solution because when you have not uh, 
a good buffering system, the pH can change. And, and this is the reason why water is not, is discouraged. Uh, water, in water, the pH changes because there is no buffer capacity. Uh, but uh, when you have a good buffer capacity, normally the pH does not change uh, during the dissolution. Okay. So they have, I just warn you, we have about 20 questions to come. So, uh, <laughs> okay. So the next is hi. I would like to ask for comp comparative dissolution testing on an oral dispersible tablet in pH 1.2, 4.5, and 6.8 medium. How do I know which pH should I focus on? Well, when, when it's an immediate release, uh, one normally says, uh, and there's no difference in the solubility, one takes 1.2 to mimic uh, the acid uh, gastrum, uh, it has, uh, uh, got some uh, conditions. Dita, Dita, they are talking about orodispersible tablet. Oh, okay. But it will never reach the. <laughs> yeah, okay, well, at least that, the tablet will not reach it. Okay, that's correct. I mean, yeah. Sorry. So probably I would go for pH 4.5. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So next question. Does capsule and tablets have different parameters for dissolution testing? Uh, but the capsule can float. Huh? That means uh, in this case, uh, one would prefer a sinker. But uh, the general agitation, for example, pedal 50 uh, RPM should be quite the same. Um, as uh, for tablet, the, the gen there's general no uh, real difference. Only in cases where the capsule tends to float, or as we talked before, in the cross-linking uh, effect, then when one can add in specific cases enzymes. Okay. So next question by Leonard again. The EMA reflection paper. The solution testing states that you may fail to prove the discriminatory nature of a method of high, for highly soluble active pharmaceutical ingredients, BCS class one and three. Do you think it's necessary to even assess the discriminatory nature of the dissolution method in the first place for highly soluble active pharmaceutical ingredients? Well, um, this depends on the also um, on the intention. For example, for me, it's very important uh, as a quality person that I can control uh, my manufacturing process and have a, a very robust, reliable manufacturing process. And in this case, if if this has no bio-relevance, uh, I'm very happy to see if there is any modification in my process. Okay, so next question. Does the pH need to be neutralized prior to quantification analysis? Well, when you uh, take the HPLC, um, you have you can um, inject directly, and I do not see why I should neutralize it when I take a UV. Um, uh, no, I, I I would take the medium directly. Okay. So now, uh, for comparative, one, checks, uh, one also checks uh, that um, uh, when one makes a quantification test, um, which influence the pH has uh, on the quantification. Okay. So the next question from Adeline again. 
For comparative dissolution testing, is it necessary for both test product and reference product to show similarity in all three pH media? If the dissolution profile is one out of the three medium does not match, is it still acceptable to prove bioequivalence? Well, th there's a clear answer. Um, similarity has to be proven in all three test media. Okay. Yeah, so this one I do not understand. It's from Jai Deep. Which are the unusual dissolution medium accepted? Yeah. <laughs> well, so the most craziest dissolution medium you have ever seen, Dita. Uh, well, um, one should take um, buffer medium from the uh, pharmacopoeia, official pharmacopoeia, and uh, this is everything else is quite um, difficult to justify. Okay, so I had one case, I think it's about 20 years ago. And uh, I'm working at the, the German agency, so we look for marketing authorizations. And at that time, the Japanese colleagues always want to have dissolution where all the active ingredient is dissolved out of the um, dosage form. And then there was a very insoluble ingredient, and then they used organic solvent at 40 degrees to get the, <laughs> the uh, substance out of the dosage form. So this was in my in my lifetime. It was the most unusual dissolution medium, which was not accepted. So okay. okay. So now we go to the next one. While validating analytical methods, it is still it is necessary to prepare the solution by running the dissolution apparatus, or can we just prepare the solution of the required concentration without running the dissolution apparatus? Yeah. You do not need it in the dissolution apparatus. This can be done uh, outside the dissolution apparatus. Okay. Normal uh, validation uh, also is performed. So now we have an incomplete question again. So, what is your suggestion on the pedal speed for modified release tablet when point, point, point? You can interpret what the question is. Okay. Well, I uh, um, normal uh, pedal speed is 50 RPM. Also for extended release, uh, and um, it can be increased when there is the uh, sticking or when there coning is probably not uh, the case in uh, extended release, uh, but start with 50 RPM. Okay, I just have a question here. I have to answer a question not understood. Okay, so the next one, other than the fluid, how can we make sure that the data we are getting is enough to interpret how the drug is going to dissolute? I do not get it because I know it goes, it goes on it. There are two questions, but I think they belong together because there are numerous other factors that can affect the dissolution rate in body as well, other than the fluid. Actually, I didn't get clearly what yeah. is meant by that. This is more in the in vivo in vitro uh, comparison. Uh, of course, there are other factors in vivo and uh, dissolution cannot be the surrogate uh, in, in every case uh, uh, for the in vivo data. Therefore, there are only limited examples where one can reach biowaver, and this reflects also again uh, the parameters which have to be met and which are described in the ICHM9 guideline. Okay, thank you. So now, I think very interesting question now. Um, I have a developed validated HPLC method. However, if I want to conduct a dissolution testing, 
on this drug product, however, the concentration would not be within my calibration range. Is there any solution by sample condensation or other way, or just choose another technique? So probably the concentration is too low to be detectable in the quantification system or quantifiable. Mm -hmm. I had an example also uh, when we had a very low concentrated uh, drug product where in, uh, we could not perform the dissolution test in 900 milliliter because this was below the quantification limit. And in that case, uh, also the reduction to 250 milliliter vessels was not successful. And uh, therefore we took uh, the flow through cell where we could concentrate it in, in a way um, that um, we were uh, above the quantification limit. There are examples where it's difficult um, to uh, quantify low amounts. Right? Okay, so thank you very much. Please stop asking questions because while we are going through this session, there were tons of questions coming. So I think we have now enough. We can uh, answer it, but then we have to close at uh, in ten minutes. So. Okay, so the next question was, is there any upper limit for use of surfactant to achieve sink conditions? Oh, I Difficult question. How uh, yeah, we had also very low soluble um, APIs, and uh, but there were, were not no abnormal uh, concentrations of um, surfactant. So. Okay. So next question: How long will it take for immediate release drug to be dissolved by in vitro process pedal type two apparatus? I think generally it's kind of 45 yeah, minutes or so. Yeah, normal immediate release uh, products uh, dissolve in 15 or 30 minutes, and uh, one performs the test then till one hour to, to see if uh, one can reach a complete dissolution. But the normal spec would be 15 or 30 minutes. Uh, and uh, then one goes a bit, bit longer to reach uh, the full, complete dissolution. Yeah, so actually I would say from pharmaceutical technology point of view, I would say immediate release is any formulation where there is no effort to slower the release. So, mm -hmm. but it's... Uh, okay, so the next one, very good one as well. Should buffering capacity of used dissolution medium be adjusted if the dosage form contains an active ingredient that can increase the pH in signif significantly. Um, as I said before, it's quite important that uh, the buffer capacity is uh, good enough uh, to compensate this. Okay, so now I have a question. I'm not that sure what is what media we will select for it normally. Yeah, I think to answer is the standard medium is uh, pH 1.2. It's HCl, I would say. This is. Mm, yes. Okay, so another one from Leonard. If you fail to attain sink conditions for a BCS class two or four active ingredient. Uh, is it a must to use surfactant to achieve sink conditions? 
Well, it depends what you want to, to show. I have also an example um, where one uh, does not want to have sync conditions because one want to see if um, the drug uh, can um, keep oversaturation yeah? when one has um, amorphic um, material um, and one will reach super saturation. In these cases, uh, one does not want to have sync conditions. Yeah, okay. On the purpose of the test. Okay, so now the last special question, and then we have these two or three general questions from the beginning. So the last special question for extended release product, the ICH guidelines say the range should be zero with 110 percent for the, the for the quantitation. So how can we perform accuracy at zero percent? Yeah. A clear answer that's not possible. <laughs> because <laughs> for accuracy, you have to check the recovery, and if nothing is in there, you cannot find any recovery. So just show that uh, the recovery at 10% is okay, then it's fine. I would ask. Or Dieter, to have another. Yeah. Maybe the thing is it's um, to see real. The zero point, yeah. Uh, if you analyze and uh, you have not added any API and you uh, test accuracy, accuracy, and to see really that this zero. If it's not zero, for example, it's twenty percent, then you have interference with the method. Yeah, but this has nothing to do with accuracy. No, the no that's, systematic no, error. Then, then you, have, you have a lack in the specificity somewhere. Yeah, or a systematic error or whatever. But uh, okay, so now we have this uh, yeah general questions. But maybe you should refer to another uh, webinar because this were not the topic here. The the question were raised just in the beginning. So is it appropriate to use bootstrap method when calculating the F two value? I think this is a little bit out of scope of this presentation. Yeah. Okay. And the next one, how do we conclude by equivalence using comparative dissolution if F2 values in one medium is below 50 in case of generics? Okay. This is also, we will cover in, in the more biopharmaceutical sessions we will have uh, in the future. Okay. So I just see whether there is something else. No, I think we got these questions. Okay, so thank you very much. We are very good in time, two minutes to go. Okay. So Dieter, maybe you just want to say bye-bye to everybody. So I say bye and thanks for particip participation. Okay, yeah. Thank you all for your participation and the questions and uh, hope we will meet in person at one of the FIP conferences or uh, at one of our next uh, webinars because I think this year probably we will have no uh, meetings in person. Thank you very much. Stay healthy and take care. Goodbye. <laughs>